Thanks so much to Wayfair for uh, having us, and thank you all for coming out tonight to uh, hear about type systems. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm I'm super excited actually about where TypeScript is, and uh, as you alluded to, there's been a lot of developments in this world over the past few years. And over the past year, I'd say that TypeScript has really taken off, and even the past few months, particularly the state of JS, sort of I think was another inflection point for it. Um, so my goal here, I want to talk through what is TypeScript, uh, should we care, why should we care, how does it compare to some of the other options that are out there, and then specifically what does it look like in the context of React applications. <clears throat> so again, very briefly about me, Chris Toomey, I work for ThoughtBot uh, Development and Design Consultancy with offices all around, one of them happening to be here in Boston. Uh, I'm at Chris Toomey on Twitter, and I also host a podcast, The Bike Shed, which is at underscore bike shed on Twitter. Uh, and since I've started to talk on it, I talk a lot more about things like React and TypeScript and GraphQL and all those fun things. So digging in, TypeScript. TypeScript builds itself as JavaScript that scales, which I think is a wonderful title. Uh, ambitious, but also I think wonderful and, and focused in what their goal is. Uh, so specifically, TypeScript is a typed superset of JavaScript. So it is strictly a superset. Every valid JavaScript uh, file is a valid TypeScript file. But then we're able to layer in more annotations, layer in that type information, inform a compiler about what's true in our application, and then allow it to uh, watch over our shoulder and keep us honest about the things that we've said. So to get even more specific, I just want to give one quick example of JavaScript versus TypeScript just so we have that context as we continue through this. This is an example of a JavaScript function. So uh, add is the function name. It takes two parameters, a and b, and the body of the function, it returns a plus b. Very simple function, but in JavaScript, things are often not exactly what they seem or could be many different things. So in this case, uh, this function can actually take two numbers and add them together and give you a number back. That seems fine. That's probably what I intended when I wrote this function. It also can take two strings, concatenate those together, and give you back the combined string. Also reasonable, I think. Um, it also can take a number and a string and do the interesting thing of combining those together as a string with the number as part of the string. Uh, and either of those arguments can go in either order. That is almost certainly not what I want, but those are the sort of errors that can creep into our programs. So with TypeScript, we're able to add that additional information. We're able to annotate our function. Here we're saying A, that first parameter, that's a number. B, also a number. And the return value of this function is a number. TypeScript can then analyze the body of the function and say, does this function actually map to that? Does the plus operator, when given two numbers, return a number? If so, we're good. If not, TypeScript will inform us of that and let us know that we need to fix some things. So with that as the foundation about TypeScript, I want to back up a little bit more and say, why types? Why should we even be considering this? What value can we get from a type system? Now, the first thing that people typically focus on when we're talking about a type system is catching bugs. We want to avoid production bugs. We want to make our applications more robust. And this is definitely a benefit that we can get from a type system. Uh, but I think this is one of those things that ends up being the, the, the top billing item, but actually not the most important. Uh, we have a lot of other ways to catch bugs, and we've been writing software for a while. Hopefully, it's not entirely filled with bugs. Uh, so in my mind, one of the main things that we can get is actually catching bugs earlier. Uh, so hopefully, we're writing tests. Hopefully, we're going through a QA cycle or poking around with the app ourselves. And we're going to find those places where it's not working correctly. But what I would love is to bring that feedback loop in as short as possible, ideally in my editor as I'm typing, let me know when I'm making silly mistakes, when I'm typoing a variable name, when I'm trying to do an operation that doesn't make sense, when I'm calling a function with the wrong number of arguments or the wrong type of arguments. These are the sort of things that, especially in a bigger application, that we have to go to the browser, fire up a page, click around a bit. That minute to multi-minute long feedback loop is just far too long. So if we can shorten that down and get that iterative feedback, focus things down all the more, uh, personally, that's the sort of a development experience that I'm looking for, and TypeScript, type systems in general, uh, can provide that. Uh, additionally, we're able to add additional documentation into our system. So that add function that we saw earlier, when I wrote it, I definitely meant for it to take two numbers and return a number, but that's actually not what I encoded into the JavaScript version. I encoded a much looser system. Uh, with TypeScript or with a type system, we are able to document what we mean so much more clearly. We're able to encode constraints into that type system. It's a different way of explaining how our program should work. Uh, from that, we also can get a ton of productivity benefits. So uh, type ahead, IntelliSense, refactorings, all of these things can actually be driven by the information that we're able to encode into that type system. 
Additionally, more and more we're seeing uh, systems that have types elsewhere in them. So your database is often going to be something with types. We're defining what the types, this is a string column, this is a boolean, this is an integer. Uh, but then as they flow into a system like JavaScript, we lose that type information. Similarly, GraphQL is increasingly popular. The last time I stood right here, I was talking about the benefits of GraphQL. Uh, I still believe in GraphQL. I think it's a wonderful technology. And it similarly has a type system at its core. So ideally, we can leverage that type information that already exists within our applications and just spread it through more of the layers. Make sure at more of those connection points, we're being honest with ourselves about the types within our system. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, refactoring or even re-architecting, because ideally with refactoring, we're not changing the behavior. Uh, but in both of those cases, type systems and compilers can be incredibly useful in helping guide our hand as we're working through changes to our system. Uh, so often, I'll, uh, when I'm working in a, a system without types, I have to think about every place that I'm using a function that I'm modifying and the way that this modification will impact all of those different call sites. With a type system, the compiler is just going to point out each of those spots and sort of hold your hand and walk you around. Uh, and personally, I love anything that lets me be slightly less smart each day. Uh, hold less in my head, focus on the things that matter, the things that I'm good at, which is making the bigger decisions, but then those little rote uh, changes that I need to make, let's push those out to a machine. They're better at it anyway. Now, some of you may have a view in your mind of type systems or dynamic. Dynamic systems is good. Static systems, not as good, less friendly. Uh, more of this sort of guard that's not letting you through, but very, um, very uncommunicative, not really helping you along, just preventing you from getting work done. Uh, perhaps you've had an experience in the past with something like Java. Um, a lot of verbosity, perhaps, with not as much benefit, but Java actually as well. But all type systems have really come a long, long way in the past many years. There's been a ton of effort put into the experience of working with these strongly typed systems. So rather than someone just telling you no, uh, I like to think of type systems as much closer to a pair. Someone watching over your shoulder and saying, oh, you forgot a you typo that, you forgot that, oh, you need to add a second argument there, and just helping you uh, not have to keep so much in your head. Uh, and I'm a big fan of all of those things. So uh, that's types in general, but also at this point in time, types are increasingly popular. For a long time, we had a wave of dynamic languages. We had Python, Ruby, JavaScript, et cetera, that were really taking over in contrast to some of the static languages. But pretty much all of them at this point have some support for static typing. So this is the typing uh, package for Python, which is now actually part of the core. It's experimental, it's new, but it's still something that they're actually adding in at the core level of Python. Similarly, within the Ruby world, this is a programming environment or compiler known as Sorbet. It's put together by the team at Stripe, and it allows for gradual type annotations and compile, and, um, compile time type checking within a Ruby application. Um, additionally, Matts, the creator of Ruby, has said that a major goal for Ruby 3 is to introduce some type of gradual type annotations. Now, of course, with the Ruby thing, they want to make sure it does not affect developer happiness and productivity, so I'm interested to see the version that they land on. Uh, but it's interesting to see Python and Ruby, two of the classically dynamic languages, uh, actually starting to embrace strong types. And JavaScript is, uh, is basically got a whole cottage industry of these things. Uh, TypeScript, PureScript, Flow, Reason, ScholarJS, Elm. I don't have it on here, but GHCJS is another one that I've poked at. There are tons of these, tons of different languages that uh, compile down to JavaScript but allow us to have some form of typing information. Uh, so the fact that there are this many of them is, is interesting. I think that's an indicator. But I think, assuming you're all convinced that types are at least worth a, uh, a second look, the question becomes, why TypeScript of this list? Now, initially, I, I was actually in a similar boat where I thought Flow might be the winner. Um, for various reasons, I thought the, the others were not necessarily the right choice for particular constraints within my world. Um, but Flow and TypeScript started with sort of different approaches to the whole typing world. And it really does seem like, unfortunately, at this point, TypeScript, well, fortunately, depending on how you look at it. If you're Facebook, less fortunately, I think. But um, it's going great for Microsoft. Uh, TypeScript seems to have won, seems to have gained an absolutely incredible mind share. Uh, and so the state of JavaScript, here we can see uh, TypeScript has almost 47% of respondents had used TypeScript and would use it again. Uh, there's a small, I want to say it's like 5% band there, something like that, that said, nah, not for me. I used it, not for me. But there's another 34% that are very interested in trying it out. I was honestly astonished when I saw this. This is way more adoption 
uh, and happy adoption than I expected to see for something so different from the core of what JavaScript is and has been historically. Uh, one of the things that I think that makes TypeScript stand out is the gradual adoption story. Uh, you don't need to dive in headfirst and fundamentally change your system to start using TypeScript. Uh, as I said earlier, all JavaScript is valid TypeScript. This is one of the design considerations that is core to TypeScript is they're not trying to change JavaScript as a language. They're trying to meet it where it is and bring gradual type annotations and all of that in, try and bring a strong type system in, but not fundamentally change everything. So you can start with the very simple act of just renaming a file. Rename from JavaScript to .ts or .tsx if you want to use JSX for React. Uh, and you can start analyzing files. You actually don't even need to do this part. You can just tell TypeScript to look at your JavaScript files. You don't even need to go through the rename. But if you're trying to go for this, I suggest the rename. Uh, then the next step, you can start to add in uh, type definitions for libraries that you're using. So say a library like Lodash has a very uh, functional interface with very clear types throughout. Now, if you add in these types, you'll get automatic uh, tab completion, particularly if you're using an editor like VS Code. And you'll also get sanity checks. It will tell you if you're misusing any of those APIs. Uh, additionally, TypeScript has fundamental to it the idea of different levels of strictness. So at the easiest level, it will be very permissive and it will be closer to JavaScript. But slowly, you can ratchet things up and turn on additional features within the TypeScript compiler to basically get it to yell at you more, uh, get it to find more potential errors or certain errors in most cases. Uh, all of these are collected under the umbrella of strict mode. So if you want to go like hard mode in TypeScript, you just say turn on strict mode. But if you want to do a more gradual adoption, there's five, possibly six different options. And you can one by one introduce those, do a big PR that changes the code base to then adopt that new rule and make everything type checked and then do that as a gradual process rather than, uh, rather than needing to dive in head first. <clears throat> as I mentioned earlier, VS Code uh, is sort of a standout editor in the TypeScript world. Um, both of these are Microsoft projects, and they seem to have done an incredibly good job of bringing the two together. Uh, and in fact, they've actually introduced a really novel concept of the language server. So uh, this is a wonderful idea where TypeScript as a language has built a server that can respond to editor-related commands. VS Code, the editor, has built a client that can issue those editor-related commands and get back the responses. So as you're typing, the editor is sending a bunch of requests over to this server process running in the background, which is responding with information about TypeScript. Now, this is fantastic because it means, although currently VS Code is untouched in how good support it has for TypeScript, it is possible that someday Vim will also have similarly good support. I dream of that day. That will be a wonderful day. Uh, but later on in the presentation, I'll use VS Code, because right now, uh, the two of them are just leading out the pack. But um, overall, this is a great idea. Uh, any language that you're working with, this, I think, is the direction that you'll see everything moving in. But as a result, the experience of editing TypeScript in VS Code, and hopefully in the future, any language or any editor, uh, is an absolutely wonderful experience. So with that, I think I've given enough of an overview. I want to now get into some of the specifics. What does this look like when the rubber hits the road? So now we're going to do some live coding. It's going to be fun. All right, here we go. Bump up the font a little bit. Everyone can see that, see the code? All right, perfect. So we're going to start uh, with this add function that I introduced earlier. Uh, and this is the JavaScript version. We're in a TypeScript file, but this is the JavaScript-esque version of it. And what we can see is down below, I have a usage where I'm passing in two strings. Now, as I implied earlier, the version of this that I actually mean is one that uses numbers. Um, so what we can do is we can come in here and start to annotate things so that we're saying that this is actually going to, uh, one more try, there we go, number. And so now we'll actually see down at the usage, we're starting to get that feedback. This is not a proper usage. So we can change things out and make this into a number. And similarly over here. So now we're adding one and two. And one of the things that I want to highlight is just how quick that feedback was. I didn't even need to save the file. It was as I was typing. Behind the scenes, the editor is making all those requests. So there's no discrete compilation step from an editor from a user perspective of the language. Behind the scene, it is just watching over your shoulder. Again, very much like a pair. Oh, you missed a spot there. Oh, you missed your semicolon. Oh, you need to pass a number to that function. Um, but here, now we're able to automatically get so much more information about things. And one of the things that I do want to highlight is, although I did specify those two parameters being numbers, we don't need to specify everything within a TypeScript system. 
So that's one of the things that classically has turned people off from static languages is the verbosity of it. I don't want to have to type ever. I don't want to say this is a number and it returns a number and that's a number. Uh, so in this case, I've said that both parameters are numbers. TypeScript knows that when we use the plus operator and the two uh, sides of that are numbers, that's going to give us a number. So here, if we look at the uh, type information that TypeScript currently is working with, it has the type annotation and the parameters, but it also has inferred that it's going to return a number. So that means if I try and do tab completion here and I start to type out things, we'll see that we're only getting information, we're only getting functions related to a number. So TypeScript has already winnowed things down and knows what we're working with. So it's a good practice to provide as much type information as you have to TypeScript so that it can keep you honest and spot check your work in that sense. But it's nice to know that you don't have to specify everything. Uh, pause there briefly. I have been talking for a while, so yeah. Can you type the, the return as well? Yes, absolutely. So this would be what that looks like if we type the return. So we just annotate one more time there on the function. And what's interesting is if I come over here and I say string, then we're going to see there's a problem here. I've said that this is a number and a string, and it returns a number, but TypeScript knows for the plus operator that is not valid. This doesn't make any sense. You've told me that this is what this function looks like, and yet you've implemented it in a way that is incompatible with that. Uh, and it's right. It is correct about that. I wrote a bad function here, so I shouldn't do that. Uh, but I can turn this back into a number, and now everybody is happy. Um, not optimized, although I have been happy with the, the look of it. It's not obfuscated or confusing. Uh, there's actually a TypeScript playground where you can go on their website and you can put TypeScript in one side and it shows you the output JavaScript on the other side, which is a nice way to gain familiarity with what, um, what different type signatures and things like that look like. But in general, it's an annotation layer on top of JavaScript, so the, the JavaScript that you will get out is just like grab all the type bits and pull them out, and then you're left with that resulting JavaScript. But you don't end up with fundamentally different code paths. Uh, that's sort of core to TypeScript's philosophy is let's not change the language, let's just add a typing layer on top of it, um, which again is incredibly useful for companies that have a lot of investment in JavaScript and large code bases and things like that. Yes, yeah, so the question was, can you do uh, essentially type overloading? Can you have different versions of the function? Uh, and yes, you definitely can do that in TypeScript. You can say, here's a type annotation for two strings, and it returns a string. Here's two numbers, and it returns a number. Uh, and then TypeScript will ensure that the single body, you can only have one body to the function, that it satisfies both of those conditions, both of those constraints. So given two strings, it has a body that satisfies returning a string. Um, so a very much supported feature that's called uh, function overloading in TypeScript. And again, that comes from the idea of, in JavaScript, you can pass just about anything. You pass any number of arguments you want. You can fuse. It, actually, it does check functionality. So that's one thing that I don't think you can be as loose as in JavaScript. But definitely the idea of passing different versions. There's also more complex ways, which we'll get into in a minute, of saying this function takes a number or a string. And you can encode that as a type, rather than having two different versions of the function signature. I'm going to dig back in here because I have a bunch of uh, examples, and I'd like to get through most of them. Uh, this is an example of a more complex function that's built up from different pieces. So add many takes an array of numbers, returns a number, and the body of that function is the reduce called on that array. And here I'm passing in that add function. Now here we can see everything does work, um, but if I were to come up and say change this out, and make this a string, then we're going to see lots of things start to yell at me. Um, but one in particular is the usage of the add function within reduce. That's part of TypeScript's knowledge of JavaScript's core standard library. It has type information about reduce, and it knows how types are going to flow through that. So if I jump back down here, instead of using add, and I'm actually going to let prettier pop that down the line. Instead of using the add function, I can actually expand this out in line. And so we'll say A and B and as I start to type these out, one of the things that's interesting, there's too many dialogues open there. <laughs> it's got a few less of those. Uh, it knows that A is a number here. That information, that type information, we're calling reduce on an array of numbers. And that type information is flowing all the way through into this anonymous function that I'm defining here. So it's, again, an example of uh, TypeScript's type inference or having those types flow through. Flowchart is a good name when they named their system, I think. 
Um, but so it's wonderful that you get, again, that sort of expressiveness and you don't need to clarify everything. Uh, but here we'll go back to using the add function and this I think is a really interesting example of the sort of errors that I make constantly that TypeScript is fantastic at solving that I am terrible at solving. Does anyone know what the error that I've introduced here is? You guys have seen the talk before, you don't get to answer. Exactly. So the error here is that I am passing in an array literal, but actually I'm using the splat or var arg style of uh, function definition, so I need to not pass in an array. Uh, very subtle, very subtle distinction. I have an array of objects, and each object has keys that are array. Those sort of nested data structures, which are incredibly common in JavaScript code, are super duper hard to remember and to get right and to see when I'm looking in my editor. Do you know who's good at that? A compiler. So. This is, oh, I don't know what that was, but uh, don't worry about that. Um, so this is, again, just a small example of the sort of things that I find so useful. And getting that feedback so much closer, so quickly within the editor, rather than having to go see a stack trace in the console, scan through, find the thing. Um, I just love this sort of dynamic, interactive experience that we get. So here we can take things to a slightly different level. Uh, thus far we've worked with mostly primitives, arrays, strings, and numbers, but here we're introducing our own new type. It's an interface here in TypeScript speak. Uh, we're naming it user. We're saying that a user is an object that can have a name, which is a string, must have a name, which is a string, and can optionally have an email, which is a string. So this question mark here implies that this property is optional. So now if I come down here, we have this function get username, which is taking in a user object, which conforms to that interface. And then, right now I haven't actually said anything about what it does, so TypeScript is like, oh, I don't know, that looks fine based on everything you've told me. This is a great example of where we would want to have a bit more of a conversation with the compiler. I can annotate this function to say that the return value should be a string. We're trying to get the user's name here, so we want that to be a string. Once I say that, you'll see that we get the little red squigglies indicating that we have an error, and I can highlight that. Type user is not assignable to type string. Totally makes sense, nice, uh, readable, human, friendly error message, thank you TypeScript. Uh, and so as I go in here, again, nice tab completion, everything that we would expect based on the information that we put into the type system, and now we've correctly implemented this function. Now, the same thing can happen here. We'll say that we want to get the email. This is also going to need that annotation to say that it's a string, or that it returns a string. What's interesting is, as I type this out and I say email, you'll note that we still have an error. And this error is related to the fact that type string or undefined is not assignable to string. And that is referring to the fact that email is a nullable or optional field. It's possible that we don't have an email based on the way that we've structured the system. This again is a sort of subtle bug that is everywhere in uh, production code. Undefined is not a function. Uh, we've all probably seen that at one point in our lives. So TypeScript does a great job of keeping us honest and saying you need to handle that. So no email at example.com. That's the specific fix I'm gonna take here. Now I have two different branches of this code. In both cases we return a string. TypeScript says, cool, you've, uh, you're honest. You're doing the thing you said you'd do, so everything is good now. Um, but again, the key is that TypeScript was giving us that live feedback, keeping us honest about what we had said about our function, and ensuring that anyone else that is using this will use it in a correct manner, can use it with confidence, uh, and trust the values that they're getting from it. And lastly, still referring to that interface user that we have up there. Uh, one of the interesting things about TypeScript and the ways that it matches so well with JavaScript is TypeScript has what's called a structural type system. So it looks at the shape of things. This is in contrast to a nominal type system where it's looking at the name of a thing. So we don't need to say, this is a new user and construct it with objects. We can just pass an object literal as long as that object literal has the right shape. Again, this is an example of where TypeScript does a wonderful job of meeting JavaScript where it is, but then helping it be a little more safe. Uh, so to look at what that actually plays out like, here we're passing an object that has name and email, they're both strings, everything is great. If I uh, delete the email, we're still fine because email is optional, but if instead I were to delete the name, we would see that we get an error, and that's because we're missing, the email string does not have the proper shape, we are missing the required type. Um, so again, just that nice feedback, all those sort of things. Now at this point, everything that I've shown you has all been within this one file. Um, I'm guessing most, uh, majority of folks in the room are using ESLint or something like that, static analysis. All right, I'll assume that's a yes, mostly yes. Uh, static analysis is fantastic and it has that same bringing those errors closer into what we're doing, but 
it only works within a single file for the most part. There's a few things that ESLint does across files, but largely we're looking inside of a single file. TypeScript really starts to shine when we look across files. So here I've uncommented this import line, and we can see we're starting to get tab completion to begin with, which is great. So I'm pulling in this start server function. And as I start to type things out, we'll see we get uh, hints about the information that we need to provide it. So that's going to be on port 3001. Uh, all of that was a really nice experience interacting across the files in our system. That's one of the examples of how TypeScript understands your program as a whole as opposed to individual files. Well, let's say I actually wanted to go in here and modify the implementation of this start server. You can see it's got a very complex implementation at console.logs, which it's doing a lot, but uh, let's say we want to enhance the interface to it. So instead of just taking a port, we're going to change it so it now takes options, which are of this new type down here, config. So what that means is we now have this interface where port is a number. We're basically changing the whole thing, and I don't know if you noticed it, but over here we've already highlighted an error. So already the system has figured out it's watching all of the different files in our system, and any change to one it's going to look through the whole dependency tree and say that actually the usage that a minute ago was perfectly fine now is broken. We can fix that very easily. We can just go in here and add the port. Uh, similarly, we can get the nice uh, tab completion for enable logging. That's the other parameter here. Um, so again, that is where things start to get really interesting. Uh, when we don't need to understand or hold the entirety of a system in our head, but we can trust the compiler to actually keep us honest and this is where refactoring becomes so much more uh, effective. I can go in and start a change anywhere and then just chase down the compilation errors, the chain of effects that that has throughout my system. So TypeScript is very cool. Uh, but we can start to look at some other, even more interesting things. So this is an example of encoding a different type of information into our system. Let's say we're working on a design system where we have buttons, and the buttons can be small, medium, or large. Those are three strings that correspond to the different sizes that we want to support. And so down here we have, uh, well, just to describe this, this is called a uh, type union. So this is where we're combining. This is basically it's small or medium or large. Now you'll note it's not string. It's not the entire class of strings, which is essentially an infinite category. It is specifically one of these three types, one of these three exact strings. What that means is as we come down to pixels, we can get some really nice help saying, did you do everything you need to? So again, we'll do the same trick of adding a return value here, and we'll see that we get an error. And what it's saying here is function lacks an ending return statement, and return type does not include undefined. Uh, we can see actually what that looks like. If we highlight it, actually before I do that, without that type definition, TypeScript is currently inferring that the return type is either the number 10, the number 15, or undefined. That undefined is the problem one. That's the sneaky one that's going to leak out into our system. We're going to try and do something with that number, but it's not a number, it's undefined. So if we go back and add that type annotation saying, this must return a number, TypeScript can see that the implementation currently doesn't support that. Uh, we're only handling two of the cases. Uh, and so what I really like here is the solution. It's quite simple. We just implement that final version. So I'll start to type this out. You can see I get nice tab completion here. It knows that large is uh, one of the string options that I can do here, and I'll make that make sense. So now large returns 25. And in this case, everything type checks. We're good. We've covered all of the possible options. Um, this is known as exhaustive pattern matching. Um, what's interesting is commonly in JavaScript code, in order to handle this and make sure you don't have errors, you might introduce a default case. Uh, so it's saying, like, I don't know, if I get something unexpected, let's not blow up at runtime, let's just handle it. But that's not ideal, because what if we were to now introduce giant? Giant is a new option. Now giant and large are actually going to be the same size, and we have no indication. That's going to silently fail in production fail for one. That's going to not have a runtime error, but it's not going to do the correct thing. So thankfully, TypeScript allows us to be more explicit. There are three types, three possible things that we need to handle. Let's make sure that we're handling all of those cases. And again, we're looking here at a single file, but this type size could be defined elsewhere, and now our pixel function is defined in an entirely other file. And it's that cross-file throughout our entire application uh, dependency management that is really fantastic and, and uh, gives me the confidence that I'm looking for. Going even deeper with this, how many folks have worked with Redux before? That's like everyone. Man, Redux took over. Uh, <laughs> Redux is great. Um, I love the explicitness. Uh, Redux actually is a very functional interface, and so it meshes, uh, meshes really well with this whole typed world. 
Uh, so here what we're defining at the top is what's called a discriminated union type. So similar to the union that we saw before, we're combining and saying an action can be this or this or this. But in this case, we have a slightly fancier version where each of the possible uh, variants has a common property. So there's the kind add, kind delete, and kind update. What's interesting is add can only come in with title, which is a string. Delete can only come in with the ID, which is a number. Update, it needs both the ID to find the specific thing that we want to update and the new title. So update will have both of those available. And now if we jump down, we'll uh, just add in a little bit more type information. So we're working on a to-do type system here. Of course, it's the only thing we could do. Uh, and we'll build out just a little bit more context here. So typical Redux type setup, we're starting with the initial state. Loading is false. To-dos is an empty array, but here there's a little bit of type magic where I'm saying not just any empty array, it is specifically an empty array of to-dos. Um, so we get a little bit of extra information in there. And from that, we can actually infer this type. We can say the type state is actually the type of that initial state thing. So we can see loading is a boolean, to-dos is an array of to-do. All great stuff. So now if we come down here to the reducer function, the core of the whole Redux world, we start to see the benefits of all of this. Uh, up here we have action, and so we're switching on the action.kind. And as I hover on that, you can see TypeScript already knows that kind is, again, one of these three possible values. Now, as I dig in here, uh, it's already going to narrow that down, give me a nice type ahead. And if I type add, when I come down here to the action within that block, TypeScript has narrowed the definition to very specifically be an action, which has kind, which is add, and the title of string. So that means I can access the title property here, and TypeScript will be plenty happy. But if I try and access the ID, that's going to be an error. And again, this is the sort of bug that I don't know about you all, but I make this sort of error constantly as I'm copying code between different branches, as I'm trying to mess around with things, I'll forget which branch happens to have access to which things. So if I leave that broken ID there, but I switch this over to be delete, well, now that's going to be perfectly fine, because in the case of a delete action, we do have access to the ID. And lastly, if we go for an update, update, then we have access to either the ID or the title, and everything is great. Now again, I'm not actually, uh, this is an improper function because I'm not returning the state or something of type state. So again, the same trick here, I can tell it that I should be returning state. Uh, one more try, there we go. And now we'll actually see a red squiggly there. I'm not going to solve that one because we've already talked through this thing. But again, working with a compiler is a bit of a conversation. Give it the information that you have and then it will keep you honest and make sure that the code that you're writing conforms to what you're talking about. All right, a few more examples. Um, Talk through this one very quickly. Uh, this is an example of combining together different types. So here, we're, similar idea. We have a use, which is primary, secondary, or danger. So design system sort of thing. Uh, and we want to say that a button can take in a use, and it has this other property, action. So now if I come in here and I start to tab complete, we'll see action and use. Everything is working uh, as expected. We'll just move on from that. But I can then extend that type, and I can say fancy button props is everything from button props, and I also want to know if the button should sparkle. That's a Boolean property that is in addition to the others. So now if I have a similar function down here, but in this case, the props are of fancy button props type, we now get all of the first two as well as sparkle. Um, so admittedly, maybe not the most impressive thing, but as you start to add all these pieces together, you see that TypeScript actually has a very expressive and powerful type system that can capture the complexities of modern JavaScript applications, which are only getting more and more complex as time goes on. Um, I'm actually going to skip this one because it's a little more complicated and it'll be covered in the next one. Um, but coming into React. So uh, React applications, uh, for a long time we've had prop types. Prop types was an attempt at getting some strong typing in there. It was the author who actually originally wrote React in OCaml, I want to say really desperately wanted some types, gave us prop types, and then everybody said, like, ah, that's probably not the best way to do that. But now that we have type systems, we can really do this. We can even go further. So here we have the interface for props. This component down here that I'm calling our sample component, it takes in a name, which is a string, and is active, which is a Boolean. We also can add some type safety to our state. So this component is also going to have some internal state. Uh, we're going to have the count, which is numbers. So we're going to click on a button and see how many times we click. So here we can see the definition for this component has a little bit of extra detail added in. We're saying it's a React component, but it's a specialized React component with this type of props and this type of state. 
And already we can see that we're getting some feedback from the type system. State is invalid right now. We've said that we must have a count, and yet we don't have a count. Uh, and so as I start to type things out, TypeScript will say, sure, I know what you need there. You're looking for count. It'll keep me honest if I try and say any string, that's not going to be a valid type. But if I go in here and I say zero, cool, everything is great. As I come down into the render function, we're now destructuring from state and props. So if I start to type this out, we know that we can get count out of the state. And this is where things are really interesting. We can get name and as active, which are the two props that we've explicitly declared. We also have access to children, which is an implicit prop that we get from the fact that we're extending a React component. All React components have access to children. Uh, and so we didn't have to say that anywhere. We just said, this is a React component with our specialization. And now we have access to all of that. Um, so we'll actually just grab name out of there. And we can come down and fill things in. And again, same sort of thing. Types are flowing through this. So these are all of the functions that one could tab complete on a string. Uh, you click count times. Uh, and then we have this handle click function. If we jump back up into the implementation of that handle click function, we can say this dot set state and even more see how the types flow through this system. So I'm going to use the, um, the function version of this, which will yield in the current state. And we can see that once again, TypeScript knows what I'm talking about. It's offering up count as tab completion there. And then within the body of the function, we get the same sort of thing. I'll wrap that in params. I forget how JavaScript syntax works sometimes, but uh, we'll say that the count, and that's count plus one. So it knows the type of this value. Count is a number. All of that is flowing through admittedly a very complicated um, sequence of things. We've got class and state and uh, all of these different things going on. Um, but again, uh, TypeScript is able to meet us where we are. Uh, the TypeScript team has done a really fantastic job of working with uh, the React team, uh, adding support for JSX, adding support for these sort of typings and helping you know, bring all of that along and make sure everything works in a way that makes sense. Now, let's see. Um, very briefly, Apollo, if anyone is using GraphQL, story is absolutely wonderful. You write your GraphQL query. You can reflect on that, dynamically generate the TypeScript types that are associated. So you don't even have to write them in this case. And then you get that information. So here's an example where from the GraphQL query, we're flowing through the type uh, and saying that this is a string or null. Again, that sort of honesty there. It's an optional value. It's going to keep me safe, make sure I don't make any errors. Um, I'm going to breeze through that one because I have one more that I want to get to and I recognize we're getting on in time. But Love this story, such a good story. Uh, lastly, just to make sure we are future friendly, uh, classes are old, right? We don't even use classes anymore, we're all hooks now. It's all hooks every day, or soon, maybe. Um, that's the idea. Uh, so the question is, does TypeScript work with hooks? The answer is yes, absolutely, fabulously even. Uh, hooks are just functions. That's one of the wonderful aspects of it. They're functions that have closures, that have values. These are all things that TypeScript and typed, lang typed functional languages understand very well. So here's an example. Uh, I'm using the use state hook. And we can see this has sort of a complicated whole thing. But the point is, I'm starting it with the number 0. And so if I jump back here onto count, we can see that in this case, it's automatically knowing that count, which I'm destructuring out of the array that's returned, that's going to be a number. Similarly, set count is a little bit more complicated to read. But what this means is it's a parameterized type over a number. So it knows that it is specific to a number. Similarly, if I were to go in here and start with false as my initial state, count is now a terribly named variable. Uh, but we can see that the value, the, the type of that has now changed to be a Boolean. Um, so the same thing is true throughout this. I've introduced my own custom uh, version here. So this is use toggle. It's a simplified version of use state that just toggles on and off. And we can see that the Boolean value flows through. Uh, this is a null function that you just call and it flips that value. Similarly, this is use context, which is going to yield out whatever value you want to read from context. So thankfully, this uh, hooks driven future is going to work fantastically in the world of TypeScript. So I'm excited to even push on that even more. Um, but with that whirlwind of me talking a lot, uh, I'll pause any questions. I'm also happy to chat after the talk. But um, in terms of the interfaces and types, mm -hmm. from other languages, I use the Unfortunately, this is one of the subtle edges. There are many blog posts on the internet uh, that try and describe the difference between types and interfaces in TypeScript. I've read a bunch of them. I still don't really know. There's a good checklist that defines one you can extend, one you can't. 
but I only know it when I'm actually looking at the checklist and I can never remember it. Um, but TypeScript will keep you honest and not let you do something that's wrong. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have a better answer than that. I don't know that they have a better answer than that yet, but that's the world we live in. Um, in your user example, I think the mm. name was a required string. Yes. You want to say that the name was required, but it was nullable. Would you go name colon question mark? Name question mark colon string. So the email uh, that was in this one here. So email with the question mark after it, that implies that it's a nullable field, so we don't need to provide it. Um, you could also say string pipe undefined, so a union of those two. That's what the question mark is a shorthand for. Um, so a little syntactic support, but that's the idea. Uh, when does it not check what you um, So TypeScript, again, meets JavaScript where it is, wants to be your friend, wants to hang out and not you know, be too pushy early on. So it is possible to just type everything as any. You can just say, like, this function returns any. It takes any and it returns any. Uh, some types that y'all pull from the community managed type library will have that in some places. In those cases, TypeScript is unable to validate anything further than this is a syntactically valid code path. So uh, more than with any other strongly typed language, I would say with TypeScript, you really want to try and meet it, give it as much type information as possible. Uh, but as a contrast, say Elm is another language that is in this space that is very, very specific. There's no escape hatch within Elm. You must tell it everything. As a result, you end up with slightly more verbose code, and you must hard switch over to Elm if you're going to do that. Um, so it's sort of a, a sliding scale, and for me, I found TypeScript to be just that right pragmatic point, but actually to also be an incredibly powerful and expressive type system that if you do want to lean into some of the more complex features, it has, uh, frankly, an amazing array of functionality and a growing list as well. There's a great team at Microsoft that just keeps, actually this morning, there was a new uh, release candidate for TypeScript 3.3. So they just keep churning it out, keep making it better, adding more advanced functionality, more advanced type features. So um, it's definitely something that you have to work on, and it's not a guarantee. There are other type systems where they say, if it compiles, it works. TypeScript's not quite there, but if it compiles, I feel way better about it than if it were just JavaScript. So speaking of it compiling, like, do you change like, the port to be more of a like, mm -hmm. parameter? Will it be, where will it yell at you? So this is running the TypeScript server behind the scenes. Types, uh, VS Code just does that automatically. Uh, secret trick, if you're writing JavaScript in VS Code, it's also running the TypeScript server behind the scenes, just on the most chilled out mode. Um, but you can also run TypeScript as a command line utility. You can say, don't emit any types, just type check this. And you can say, type, type check my whole system here, make sure everything's uh, all checked out. And actually, behind the scenes, when it starts up the server, it's going to crawl the file system and look at all the files. So even though you're only editing one and that's what you're seeing, TypeScript is checking that all around. And so there is a little list down here of all of the ways in which I've done bad things. And you can see it's across a bunch of files. So both the TypeScript server and the TypeScript command line utility will give you that feedback on mass, but also allow you to focus in on just the thing that you're working with at that time. Yes, so uh, the question was, do you typically find yourself working in strict mode? And if so, what does your workflow look like when you hit something that's coming from the community maintained package library and, and maybe isn't uh, up to the strictness line? Uh, so the first answer would be strict mode from the start for anything that I'm starting. Um, so if I can, I want to start with the most secure, most complete implementation of the type system possible. That said, um, sometimes that's not an option. If I'm coming into an existing code base, I might not start with strict mode and then try and do that more gradual adoption. Uh, when it comes to things coming in from type libraries, unfortunately, the, there is sort of a double-edged sword. There is an amazing type library out there. It's called Definitely Typed. It's community maintained, but it is a great singular source for all of this information, but it is community maintained, so the quality of types will vary. React, as an example, has fantastic types. Uh, the day hooks came out, somehow they automatically, they already had types. I think they might have been given some advanced information. Um, whereas some much less used library might have a less complete type system or, or type uh, annotation there. So in that case, you might opt out locally. You, uh, I would not want to turn off strict mode throughout a project because of a specific 
uh, set of types that were not necessarily uh, aligning, I would try to find any other way to just locally uh, reduce the the type intensity, as it were. But um, that's sort of a case by case basis, unfortunately. Can you use different levels of strict mode? Like using an example, like can you use strict mode in one file and not strict in another? Mostly, I've seen it as a global config. There's a config file for TypeScript, and that's where you set that. So I think it is a singular project wide setting, and ideally, that's the mode you're in. If you get to strict mode, stay there. Try not to opt out an individual file, but then you can do similar to ESLint. There are ways to say like, "Hey, TypeScript, uh, just you know, let this one go. Let's just, let's just be friends." Um, that sort of thing. So it would be more local overrides in that sense, as opposed to don't do strict mode in this file. All right, I think we'll do one more question, and then we should wrap it up because I've been talking for a long time. Yes. Uh, da, 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 da. What's the TS config? That's the one. So here I have strict set at the top level. Um, VS Code does have an interesting thing where there can be slight differences between the version of TypeScript that VS Code is running and your project. But ideally, you tell VS Code, do the thing that I said in the file anyway. You want to have that consistency so that as it's running on CI and you're doing the full type checking of the whole project, you get the same sort of feedback that you would in the editor. So ideally those two do align, but there is a possibility for, for slight variation if needed for some reason. Okay, with that, thank you so much. I hope everyone enjoyed that. Happy to answer any other questions, but uh, that's good.